the thousands of fans who have helped make Dallas the highest rated program in TV history, then you'll have no problem recognizing this man's face. He's South Fork Ranch Foreman Ray Krebs, but his real name is Steve Keneally. Mr. Keneally was in Tuscaloosa recently for the grand opening of Parisian's department store. Although he was discovered by the legendary film director John Huston, it wasn't until he joined the cast of Primetime's hottest show that his popularity reached an all-time high. For this reason, Steve Keneally doesn't mind being the Dallas Cowboy who doesn't play football. Steve, first of all, how did you get into the business? I suppose some people would think that, uh, you know, I, I had the great stroke of luck or the gift or the thing that people would give up anything to get. Uh, to me, at the time, uh, it was kind of a whim. It, it turned out to be something that, uh, well, you couldn't necessarily walk away from. Uh, what had happened was I, I got interested in films, but only in a technical sense, as I was a technical advisor uh, on the writing of the film Apocalypse Now. And John Milius was a friend of mine. The, who wrote that script 12 years ago. It took 10 years to get it produced. Uh, and then somebody said, well, gee, John, you ought to use Steve as uh, this character in the show. He's a terrific. He'd be a natural. And I said, oh, come on, you guys. Uh, I was a Vietnam vet, had come back home, and uh, was going to school on the GI Bill. And uh, when that project didn't work out, the thought was implanted in my mind. And at some time later, uh, perhaps a year later, uh, I was introduced to John Houston, and again, the suggestion was to John in this case, why don't you use Steve in this role? And Houston and I had a nice meeting, and he said, well, what do you think, Steve? How would you like to do this picture with us? And I said, well, gosh, you know, I mean, of course, I'd love to. And he says, well, wonderful then, boys, let's all just drink on it. And, uh, I mean, literally, uh, you know, a top big old-time famous director just said how would you like to be in this picture and I said yes and he knew I was a non-actor I'd never been in a play in my life and uh, I, I felt a certain amount of, uh, of comfort in making the choice and saying yes I would do it in, in regard to the fact that I was playing a Western character and had always had a great regard for Western films and, and Western stars and had grown up loving the old Western shows that they used to air in the early days of television and uh, I thought, well, gosh, you know, I know enough about cowboys where I can go out and, and play that part. Uh, I had a one-week guarantee on the picture, which is not much of a guarantee at all. It turned out that um, I worked for 10 weeks on the show, and the part grew as the show continued, and I ended up with a major role in a major picture. Uh, Paul Newman starred in it. Interestingly enough, uh, Victoria Prince of Paul played a lead role in this picture, and that's when I first met Victoria. And I didn't see her again uh, for nine years until we uh, worked together on the same series. Let's talk about Dallas, because that's what is the big thing now. When you first uh, joined the cast of that series, what did you think? Did you think it was going to be as big as it is now? No, uh, I thought it was, for, for, first of all, we we began what we call a miniseries, which is going to be five shows, a limited series, which is, is a pilot in a sense. You see, the concept is to go with five shows on five consecutive weeks rather than one two-hour pilot because the competition may blast you out of the picture on that particular night and nobody sees your pilot and then you never get a shot at it. So with five weeks, you have five weeks running and sooner or later you, you pick up some interest and build an audience. And it took all five of those shows to sell the series. Uh, I felt, uh, after looking at the first script, that it was really something. I thought of it as being like a television version of Giant. And as the succeeding four scripts arrived, they were all very good, too. And I really felt we were doing a quality piece of work. In fact, too good to be a series. I felt that it was going to go the way of other shows that I had personally enjoyed on television and be uh, perhaps too sophisticated uh, for the average American television public. And uh, in a way, it was. The show today is not what we started doing four years ago. It's gone through an incredible transition. And uh, at this point, people call it a soap opera, which in a sense it is. It's really not. As anybody that does soap operas will tell you, uh, they do 30 pages of dialogue standing on one mark. 
and uh, and they never move and that you know it is a three camera live sort of situation and we film and uh, you know it's basically a television series but you have the aspect of continuing development of character and a continuation of life as life is so that's the element of soap opera we actually have a, a very fast pace on our show I believe too uh, not like daytime drama where you can tune in up two months later and you're still sort of up with what was happening our show moves at a very crisp pace and and that's a kind of an important aspect I think you've had a very successful year on Dallas and on the last episode we saw a body floating in the swimming pool and we were wondering who it was can you tell us who it was on the very last day of filming our last season I worked that day and uh, I, there was a lot of hush hush we, were, we received the last script minus many pages, and it said at the end of the, you know, it was about 15 pages short, it said, the remainder of the script would be available to persons on a need-to-know basis. And that was not me, because I didn't get those pages. So I happened to be there the last day. I said, well, I'm not going to let this happen to me this year. I'm, I didn't know who shot JR. I said, I'm going to stay and see what goes on. Well, they had uh, Victoria that plays uh, Pamela, and uh, Linda Gray, that's Sue Ellen, and uh, Mary Crosby, uh, who plays Kristen, all there, all dressed in sort of similar, not identical, skirts and light-colored blouses. And all three girls went in the pool. And they shot a bunch of other variations. J.R. had a gun in his hand at one point, and Cliff Barnes jumps in the pool and says, Oh, Kristen, oh, oh, Sue Ellen, oh, Pam. And they shot all these possibilities. And uh, it's the same thing we did last year when they shot J.R. They shot at least a half a dozen characters saying, Take that and that and pulling the trigger. And it could have been any one of those people. In this case, I think you have to use some common sense and say, well, who's expendable in this case? Is it either of the two girls that have been with us from day one and now are in the fourth year of shooting, or is it the guest that's been with us sort of in and out over the last year? Uh, it's not particularly a catching ending as, as who was shot JR, but I don't think they tried to match that. I think, you know, you were crazy to try and, and come up to that level because it, it couldn't be done no matter what you did people would say well it wasn't as good as last year working for the same outfit as long as you have I'm sure you developed kind of a family relationship with the different players on Dallas and it was really sad when Jim Davis passed away how is that being handled in the story well everybody loved Jim I never met a man that didn't love Jim he was a very giving person uh, he spent 40 years in the business, and, and the one way we console ourselves is to consider how much this success meant to him in the last three years of his life. And he, he truly did die a happy man, I know that. And uh, uh, we would like to have made changes immediately, but a writer's strike that was current prevented that. We couldn't change very much. So what we'd have is Jock alive in the first shows. Alive, but we don't see him. Uh, Jock and Ellie were on a second honeymoon in Europe. And now when they're all coming back and we're going to meet them at the airport, here comes Ellie, but Jock's not with her. And we're all saying, well, what happened? Where's Jock? Well, he had to stop off in Washington. He's going to do some business with the government, has to do with the oil business. Well, he continues on in Washington, and uh, we filmed five shows at this point, and as we finished the fifth show, he's still there, and he's involved with government work, and he may be doing some traveling. Well, I think they're going to continue to keep the character alive. The way we do is we have one-sided phone conversations. We're all sitting at having breakfast, and the phone rings, and it's Jock, and Ellie picks it up, and she says, Oh, Jock, well, when are you coming home, and what are you doing? We all say, Well, what did he say? And in this way, he's alive. Um, They'll never replace the character with another actor. It's, uh, none of us wanted that. Nobody. And uh, I don't know if they're going to have the character die or not. Uh, one theory is that he may, for instance, crash in an airplane uh, in South America, an unknown, unknown location, and, and never be found. So, in fact, he's not dead, but he's missing. And uh, with that note, the character is alive. And, and in fact, uh, the producer did tell me, and I know he wants to do this, um, they'd like to keep Jim's credit in front of the show in memoriam for the length of the duration. So we all, we all felt very strongly about that. Will Sue Ellen find happiness this season? <laughs> he 
Yes, Sue Ellen is going to find happiness this season. I, I'm not giving away too much. She finally does leave JR. And when I said that earlier this afternoon, the audience went wild. I mean, <laughs> uh, all of our characters are in constant transition. In a sense, we're all like players in a chess game. Each one has a particular function and can move in certain directions. Uh, but we're all kept in transition. This is what keeps actors happy. It's what keeps the show interesting. And uh, I don't have a real solid idea of where I'm going or where the show is going this season. As I mentioned, this, this writer strike has caused an immense amount of problems. As we sit here today, I have a work call on Tuesday and I uh, have yet to see a script. There may be one when I arrive in Los Angeles on the weekend and I might not see it until I arrive on a set on Wednesday to work. Uh, this is what you get used to in television production. What ways has, has the success of the series changed your life? Well, um, this is my 12th year as an actor. I've, I've never had to do anything except act as I got into the profession. I managed to live through some thin years and collect unemployment. And uh, I'm an artist and I've sold paintings and made jewelry and things like that when things were rough. In fact, I had a very, very bad year just prior to Dallas. Um, it was a year where I was up for all the major leads in various television pilots for series and television movies and features and ended up being the second choice or the third choice. And Jeff Bottoms got it or Jeff Bridges or, or Bo Hopkins or Sam Elliott or one of the other guys that are my contemporaries that were also up for the role. And it was very gratifying to be considered for many of the roles that I was up for, but it is the worst thing in the world to be so close so many times as this year was. And, and in the end, end up broke. And, uh, you know, considering uh, towards the end of this particular year, uh, looking for uh, other work. Uh, at this point, I'm married. I want to have children. I want, you know, I own a home. I want to have a regular life. I don't want to be subjected to uh, this rejection and, 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 and a career that seemed to be going in circles, in a sense. And uh, so when Dallas came, it, it really sort of turned that whole thing around, and, and that's really behind me at this point. Uh, we have the largest audience of any television series over the last 20 years. Uh, this is a hell of a format. It's a medium that uh, I think I particularly appreciate. Uh, I, as an actor and as a person, reach out in an interview like this, in talk shows, in personal appearances, as I was involved with today. I go out, I meet those people. These people will say, gee, I met Steve. He was an interesting person. I like his work. They'll always watch every show I ever do. Um, there's this broad base from which to operate that the show provides. Of course, it also provides a lot of financial incentives. Um, <laughs> Although my lifestyle could never be described as, quote, Hollywood, unquote. I don't know if that lifestyle does exist, by the way. Well, you've had a lot of success with Dallas, but what do you hope to be doing 10 years from now? Well, sometimes I wonder, uh, how can I continue in this uh, incredible world of acting and television and films that I'm in? It's a very unusual kind of life, and you have to realize that when a show becomes uh, what this show is, many of your personal freedoms and liberties are erased. And, and I find myself hiding in crowds and sneaking through airports. And it's a very unnatural thing. So I, I toy with the idea of getting on the other side of the camera. But I'll probably still be acting. I like to be doing some films. Uh, no doubt, still be living in Los Angeles, where we do all the work. Uh, it's been a very interesting career for me. I've had some wonderful breaks. I've had, like I said, some real down periods too, but you need those to grow from, I think. And uh, it's, a, it's kind of a, a fascinating uh, aspect to our culture in, in America, especially. It's such a big industry. And I, I've kind of grown up in the heart of it, even though I wasn't involved with it until I was 25. Um, I'll probably still be there.